Hi, my name is Deborah Denenholtz Morse, and I'm giving my paper Queer Dreams Visioning the Invisible in Emily Bronte's Weathering Heights. Nellie, do you never dream queer dreams? she said suddenly, after some minutes' reflection. Yes, now and then, and so do I. I've dreamt in my life dreams that have stayed with me ever after and changed my ideas. They've gone through and through me, like wine through water, and altered the color of my mind. And this is one. I'm going to tell it. But be careful not to smile at any part of it. And now I'm going to pour wine through water. I want you to be able to see Catherine's mind as Heathcliff enters it. Ah, it swirled nicely. Put a little more. The white water is now red, swirling. Emily Bronte's only novel, Weathering Heights, has always been recognized as strongly influenced by the Gothic Romantic tradition in English literature. Indeed, it is the final novel included in Robert Keeley's classic, The Romantic Novel in England, as it, and has inspired Gothic interpretations that range from Joseph Wiesenfarth's emphasis on the Gothic domesticated to Diane Long Hoveler's Gothic feminism. We expect ghosts in this literary tradition, a visioning of the invisible that causes terror or wonder, that is dreaded or desired. I want to suggest that Wuthering Heights can be read as Emily Bronte's queer dream, in which she imagines the transgression of boundaries between the visible and invisible through the character of Heathcliff. Catherine's queer dream, the red wine that colors her mind, is Heathcliff, the dark gypsy boy she loves. Heathcliff performs both the profane Eucharist and a miracle that Catherine's language implicitly compares to Jesus' wedding miracle at Cana when he turned the water into wine. This miracle is sacred to Catherine, although it would be considered profane to conventional Christians. She tells the queer dream that is like the wine through water, the dream knowledge that Heathcliff is more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. And Linton's is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire. Nellie, I am Heathcliff. Kathy's words are a radical statement in which she identifies herself with the divine, embodied in Heathcliff, the god within my breast that Emily names in her most famous poem, No Coward Soul is Mine. The words not only express a heretical religious vision, however, in their conflation of an English lady with a lower-class, dark-skinned man, Catherine's declaration transgresses boundaries of gender, race, class, and nationality, resisting conventionally demarcated identities. I am male. I am a field hand. I am a gypsy. I am dark. I am other. This is her religion, and Heathcliff is as surely the eternal rocks beneath, as Simon Peter was the rock upon which Jesus claimed he would build my church. Moreover, if Heathcliff is more myself than I am, Kathy's statement can also be interpreted as a love of what is the same, what is like, and thus could be viewed as a statement of same-sex love. Kathy's identification with Heathcliff can be interpreted as self-love as well, as Stevie Davies has argued in Emily Bronte, heretic. There are many interpretations of the mysterious outsider, Heathcliff. They include his being a force of nature like the weather on the moors or the very earth of the heath itself, as his name suggests, Heathcliff as a representative of the underclass or of the Irish who were streaming into Liverpool because of the famine, just as Emily Bronte began writing Wuthering Heights in the fall of 1845, or Heathcliff as a figure for all racially oppressed groups, as Patrick Brantlinger has most recently argued. Mahalisa von Schneidern, in her 1995 article, 
Heathcliff and the Liverpool Slave Trade, and later Christopher Haywood in the introduction to the 2002 Broadview edition of Wuthering Heights, view Heathcliff as a slave. Haywood's edition has a photograph on its cover of the historical black actor Ira Aldridge playing Othello. Heathcliff is portrayed as a slave in Adam Lowe's obscure screen adaptation, A Regular Black. Andrea Arnold's more widely viewed 2010 film Wuthering Heights also portrays a black Heathcliff whose oppression is motivated by racial prejudice. Deirdre David argues that Heathcliff could be a native of one of the British Empire's far-flung dominions, come to the port of Liverpool, perhaps as a stowaway. Heathcliff has been interpreted as a non-human animal, especially a dog or wolf, and particularly as Emily's bull mastiff, Keeper. Heathcliff has only one name, like an animal, perhaps a dog, or like a supernatural being, like God or the devil. Heathcliff has also been analyzed as a Fallen Eve figure by Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar long ago, and alternatively as a priapic god. Thomas Mosier famously argued in Whatever Happened to Emily Jane that whenever Heathcliff was around and breaking into and out of houses, pregnancies were soon evident. Some scholars contend that Heathcliff can be understood best from a biographical perspective. The psychiatrist and scholar Philip Wean reads Heathcliff and Catherine as a mother-child relationship that expresses the traumatic loss Emily Bronte experienced at three years old when her mother died an agonizing death from stomach cancer, a loss repeated when her maternal eldest sisters, Maria and Elizabeth, were sent home from Cowan Bridge School to die a few years later. Other scholars suggest that the Heathcliff-Catherine bond figures Emily's love for her younger sister Anne, co-author of The Gondol Juvenilia, and Emily's twin, as Charlotte Bronte's best friend Ellen Nussie called her. Anne was the sister Ellen remembered as seeming always to have her arms intertwined with Emily's as they roamed on the moorland. Heathcliff may be Mr. Earnshaw's illegitimate child rather than a street urchin, a surmise that is strengthened by the knowledge that Heathcliff is the name of an Earnshaw's son who died in childhood. Heathcliff has come instead of Mr. Earnshaw's promised gifts, a whip for Kathy and a fiddle for Hindley. He is a force of destruction and creation. He may be a scourge of God, cleansing the houses of Wuthering Heights and Thrushbust Range of original sin, possibly old Mr. Earnshaw's adultery, or old Mr. Linton the magistrate's vicious prejudice against Heathcliff as a dark, lower-class foreigner, an attitude expressed in his declaration that the little Lascar Heathcliff should be hanged at once when he and Kathy are caught looking into the windows of Thrushpouse Grange. Excuse me. Emily Bronte's story is constructed through violent rupturings of consciousness and urgent breaches of formal constraints. Lockwood's dream rape of the girl ghost Catherine Linton at the window is one instance of this liminality. As the novel opens in 1801, Lockwood is recording his first terrifying visit to his landlord at Wuthering Heights. He writes in his diary about a frightful dream while staying in a room at Wuthering Heights that is usually shut up to strangers. Lockwood sees and touches Catherine's carved names on the window ledge. Catherine Earnshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, Catherine Linton, and views the handwriting in her testament, whereupon a glare of white letters started from the dark, as vivid as specters, the air swarmed with Catherine's. Lockwood then hears distinctly the gusty wind and the driving of the snow. I heard also the fir bough repeat its teasing sound. His intrusion wakens the gold, ghostly specters of the room's past history. He sees the girl ghost, whose imploring voice beseeches him to let me in, let me in. 
Lockwood speaks to her, refusing her entrance into the bedroom. He sees the red blood after terror made me cruel. I pulled its wrist onto the broken vein and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Lockwood's vicious dream rape, the most violent action in a novel suffused with violence, suggests his misogyny and fear of intimacy, as Beth Newman and others have argued. His actions confirm his tale about gazing upon a beautiful woman at the seashore, a veritable goddess in my eyes, as he writes, and then rejecting her after she reciprocates when he confesses that he shrunk icily into him myself, a description suggesting impotence. Stevie Davies argues, the binary imagination of Emily Bronte rooted terror and desire in a single source, the inhuman face of the girl at the window, the longing for our dead to come home, which also terrifies us. But it is surely Heathcliff's urgent, restless desire, as much as Lockwood's touching and voicing of her name that has called Kathy forth from the grave. When Kathy dies, Heathcliff profanely invokes his own haunting by Kathy, desperately conjuring her troubled spirit. And I pray one prayer. I repeat it till my tongue stiffens. Catherine Earnshaw, may you not rest as long as I am living. You said I killed you. Haunt me then. Be with me always. Take any form. Drive me mad. Only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. Paul Hemus, in erotic faith, has noted the intense desire, observed the phallic stiffens. In her delirium, Kathy promises the invisible Heathcliff that she will never be quiet in death as Christian religion commands. I'll not lie there by myself. They can bury me twelve feet deep and throw the church over me, but I won't rest until you are with me. I never will. After hearing Lockwood's ghost dream, Heathcliff's passion impels him to vigorous movement. He got on the bed and wrenched open the lattice, bursting as he pulled at it into an uncontrollable passion of tears. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Kathy, do come. Oh, do once more. Oh, my heart's darling, hear me. This time, Catherine, at last. Earlier in the story, but later in the novel, when the married Catherine Earnshaw Linton is in delirium at Thrushbrush Grange, she does not recognize her own face and thinks she is back at Wuthering Heights. As she looks at the mirror, which she thinks is the dresser at her old room at the Heights, she is assured by Nellie that it is yourself, Mrs. Linton. You knew it a while since. Of course, Kathy does not know the face in the mirror. Imagining herself back in her childhood bedroom, she expects, she expects the face to be that of Kathy Heathcliff, her core identity. But she sees Mrs. Linton, a social construct she does not know. This traumatic event has occurred 20 years before Lockwood's gothic dream of a girl ghost who calls herself Catherine Linton and who begs to be let in to the room in which the stranger Lockwood is staying at Wuthering Heights. As we learn later on in the novel, the girl Catherine Earnshaw slept in the bed in this very room with her stepbrother or her half-brother Heathcliff in the very coffin or womb-like bed in which Lockwood now dreams. Catherine's delirium, in which she longs to be a girl again, half savage and hardy and free, is another instance of this turbulent disturbance of consciousness and the dislocation of self. Catherine pulls apart the pillow from her marriage bed with her teeth, animal-like, tasting the cloth and feathers, symbolically tearing up her union with Edgar and even perhaps figuring a wished-for abortion 
of Edgar's child, the seed within her that attests to her mature womanhood and to her penetration, her violation, by what is not Heathcliff, not more myself than I am. She thrusts herself outside the window, despite Nellie's admonitions that she will catch her death of cold, insisting that she be outside upon the moors, that Nellie won't give me a chance of life. Earlier in the story, when Kathy returns from her first visit to the Lintons and Thrushcross Grange, she wears dead nature, a beaver hat with an ostrich feather on it, and she is dressed in a ladylike writing habit. Now in her madness, Kathy liberates the natural world and her own natural self as she releases the feathers enclosed in the bed pillow, which, Nellie remarks, are flying about like snow. Kathy ranges the, pil the pillow's feathers in Ophelia-like madness, trying to find a new order that will satisfy her mind and accommodate her memories of predation on the moors with Heathcliff when he shot the lapwing parents and put a cage over the baby bird's nest so that they starved. Catherine speaks aloud to the absent Heathcliff in her delirium about the arduous movement from life to death. It's a rough journey and a sad heart to travel it. And we must pass by Gimmerton Kirk to go that journey. Kathy declares to Nellie and Heathcliff just before her death that she will be transcendent, incomparably beyond and above you all. But Kathy has also promised that if Heathcliff will venture among the gravestones of Gimmerton Kirkyard, I will keep you. Catherine's girlhood diary written in the margins and between the lines of a testament, is her rebellious attempt to find a new narrative and religious form in which to express her experience of being with and being Heathcliff. All of these fervent explorations can be viewed as metonymic for Wuthering Heights itself, a literary shapeshifter. It has long been recognized by scholars such as Stevie Davies that I am Heathcliff is a strange and heretic declaration. What is most remarkable about the statement is its echoing of the eternal I am that God speaks in Exodus, the identification Kathy makes of herself with the divine Heathcliff. But perhaps as memorable are the images of the invisible Heathcliff made visible as the wine through water of Kathy's queer dreams, or of Catherine as the girl ghost trying to return to the bed she shared with Heathcliff at Wuthering Heights. At the novel's end, Catherine finally enters the bedroom window, crossing its boundary to take Heathcliff in death his face rainwashed in a kind of profane baptism into his life after death with Kathy. The shepherd boy sees what others cannot see, and the sheep into it a ghostly presence and are skittish. There's Heathcliff and a woman yonder under to nab and I darn it pass him. Revenants of the Romantic Era Catherine and Heathcliff profanely wander in a sacred liminal space that is heaven on earth. Thank you.